How would you describe the work you do and what are your central goals with, with all your work? Well, I'm laughing because um, my daughter, who's probably not that much younger than you, she's 21. Mm -hmm. uh, she came to visit recently and she actually just asked me straight out. She's like, what do you do? <laughs> she was and she and her sister, who's 19, were having that chat and they had no idea. Um, and it's as you as you mentioned in the preamble before we started recording, this is a it's always been a difficult question to answer. I would say it's it's something like this. Um I find myself, let's just put it that way, I, I find myself with the with the conception or the perception that we find ourselves um in a an extraordinarily unusual context i won't one might even say a singular context mm -hmm. uh, meaning that it, there are no obvious reference there are no obvious methodologies or practices or institutions for sure mm -hmm. uh, that are appropriate to help us individually and collectively make effective choices in the context we find ourselves and the context we find ourselves in has a certain significant intensity to it. Um, you can pick your poison. You can kind of drill down on any particular aspect of the world we live in and be like, wow, that is, there's a, there's a lot of potential and that potential includes a potentially significant amount of change. Mm -hmm. um, so metaphorically, it would be a little bit like, you know, the, the examples that I'm thinking of are, are uh, um, all coming from the, psychedelic universe so mm -hmm. you know once upon a time somebody told a story of what, what is it like to take dmt and he said well imagine that you were a uh, you know a stone age tribesman who just been living in a jungle for example for your whole life and then you you know all at once with no particular preamble you found yourself hovering upside down above times square and you were just forced to deal with the fact that this is a context with which nothing that you prepared you to make sense of, and you had to start to figure out how to make sense of it. So what I broadly do is endeavor to figure out how can I and we collectively make sense of the context we find ourselves in, mm -hmm. but for the purpose of how can we actually make effective choices in the context we find ourselves in. Now that's simultaneously incredibly abstract and in many ways incredibly vague. Mm -hmm. um, so but perhaps as we walk through our conversation, that frame, we can sort of cast some light yeah. on it. We can elucidate it in some fashion. Yes. No, that's actually that's actually very helpful trying to, con to contextualize. It's not any one thing you're doing, but it's given that we find ourselves in a, you know, a strange time, how can we have the capacities both individually, but also like in our institutions and like collective capacities, how can we make sense and interact in this world i mean one, one question that that makes me think of is would you say that in the past was there some time where humans did have a good way of making sense of the world and is it just okay is it not just but is it part one part of the problem that the world has changed so fast is that something yeah i think um well there's, there's like two layers to what you're, what you're saying there one is um yeah in, in a simple sense, yes, that uh, periodically, for I think a substantial fraction of our, our, our existence, we have had a, a cultural toolkit, uh, and, and by the way, and, and our own biological toolkit, that were relatively well suited for the context that we found ourselves in. Right? So we go all the way back to kind of the upper Paleolithic, um, humans living in you know, pre-human nature are actually pretty well suited for that environment, like super well suited, which is why I've been so successful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our special superpower of, of niche transition, our ability to, to move from, you know, the, the plains of Africa to the Swiss Alps, not in one step, but over a period of time, mm -hmm. by virtue of building new cultural toolkits, which supplement our actually rather generalizable um, biological toolkit actually made us high, highly uh, fit and adapted to whichever context we found ourselves right, in. Right. But that superpower comes with a problem, which is that we're super empowered to engage in, um, oh shoot, what's that called? Niche construction, which is to say that we can we change the world that we live in. Right. 
Um, and, and as a consequence, we find ourselves now living in a context which is um, beyond the, tool, the cultural toolkits that we have thus far developed and very far away from our basic biological toolkit. And so we are uh, we sort of highly alienated from the context that we ourselves have created. Mm -hmm. And okay, so that's that's like that's the first answer. The mm -hmm. second answer is this niche transition thing, which is that we have we have a capacity to develop new institutions, to develop new kinds of cultural capacities. Maybe even, by the way, to innovate new kinds of biological capacities to a greater or lesser extent. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there's a meta question, which is the, the, what's the meta approach by which we become, we en kind of enter into the journey of becoming adapted to the context that we find ourselves in. And right? so there's like, for us, for humans, there's always two stories going on. One is, are we wearing the right kit for the environment we're in? And if not, are we a taking the right approach to learn how to wear the right kit for the environment that we're in. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You know, I have like probably lists of questions just because I'm, I'm interested in many topics, but I just want to keep exploring this and, and at the risk of asking almost a poor question and, and the risk of going into a dead end, I'm, I'm interested in how you talk about almost a meta approach. It's not, it's not just that we, when we start constructing niches ourselves, right, and then we start living in those, and it can, and it's almost like reciprocal cycles of that. So then, increasingly, we don't. It's we're living and inhabiting strange places. When I, I, I wanted to almost ask at one point, you know, might have I think about the the institutions we've made, like say governments or academic institutions and things, and and one one part of me wants to go. So were they perhaps at one point? very adaptive and they worked or I'm, all, I'm just interested in asking like even going down the routes that we've done and the way we've created the civilization that we have at the moment and 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 however in the many multifaceted ways that it works is that approach in general has that been almost uh -huh. could could we have it approached it different differently or like like I'm sometimes it's like not just it worked, but now we need to change. But does that make sense? Even just, I don't know how. That, um, it's not really a question, but you know, if you, <laughs> anything to say to that? You seem like you want to respond. Yeah, well, we'll just um, I'll lob back. We're we're gosh, there's so many. Let me see if I can hold that. Yeah, I'll stick with where we are right now, but in a moment, I think I might bring okay. in a different. Concept. So, uh, what made me laugh is that I was thinking to myself, okay, I hate to complicate things by, by uh -huh. you know, things at the level of, you know, there's two, two responses, but in this case, there's actually three responses to what you just said. So let's see if we could take it step by step. So with regard to a given, let's say, set of institutions, and it's important to recognize the institutions come in sets. Mm -hmm. They link, they link together. There's no given, like no institution is functional by itself because right. for human being is complex. Right. Um, you, you can't actually imagine, for example, a grocery store, which is part of the food system, mm -hmm. without also having cars. Like right. those don't, you can't have one without both because mm -hmm. cars, you know, uh, gasoline power transportation, right? Those, are, those institutions are intimately interlinked. Okay, so a given set of institutions, mm -hmm. um, within that category, we actually have two little variables. Um, one is, and this, this maps to what we were talking about earlier, um, the degree to which the set of institutions is, is let's say, fit for purpose. Right? The simple metaphor would be something like, you know, I've got a, a Phillips head screw. Do I have a Phillips head screwdriver, right? Is the institutional structure fit for purpose? And, and by the way, they, they tend to move in and out of sweet spots. Right? So mm -hmm. in, in the early days, when they're just beginning to be figured out, they're they're new, and so they don't quite know exactly. We don't. They're not quite well adapted, or fit, or optimized for the context that they're emerging into. Um, and then they actually become relatively fit. This is, by the way, the shape is generally an S curve. If you're familiar with that that, mm. that sensibility. Uh, so in the beginning, they're in explore mode, trying to figure out how to do their thing, and then they kind of become, oh, okay, this is how we do it. And the institutions become increasingly um, compact, meaning they don't have more filigree than they need. Uh, mm -hmm. But they have exactly what they do need, and it's actually not over overburdened. 
um, so then it becomes fit for purpose. But then this other piece up here happens where they become less fit for purpose because the context has changed outside of the flexibility and rate of change of the institution itself, right? That's mm -hmm. not that hard to get. Like that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we could pick an example if, it, if you'd like. Um, let me think. Well, we'll think of one in a moment, but I wanted to get this other point in. Sure. But an important element is to recognize that institutions also have a characteristic of aliveness and deadness, or um, like you know, an, an internal fluidity and creativity and adaptiveness and responsiveness versus a uh, kind of our, our, our typical way of thinking about it would be something like being captured or being calcified or being mm -hmm. bureaucratic bloat. And, and, and this is another piece of the story. Right? So if I have a an alive institution that is not fit for purpose, well, what are, one of the things that's characteristic of it being alive is that it's perceptive capacity to notice that it's not fit for purpose and it's internal flexibility to change in the degree to which and the way at which it needs to change to become fit for purpose is still active. It's still there. Um, but if I have a dead institution, um, it doesn't have those capacities. It can't perceive change in its environment. And it definitely can't change internally to, to map to its environment. So this is again, now a double strata problem, but then that will make it more challenging adding another whole other piece on top of it. And this would be something like mindset or kind of mind or mentality. And just to make, kind of make an example here, I want to compare medieval mind and modern mind. And if you explore those two concepts, and uh, actually Jonathan Peugeot had a video recently with a, uh, a guest that explored that concept, I think, nicely enough to make it clean understand what the differences are. And the differences are rather profound. I'll just give you a simple example. There are some mindsets that have an intuition of time that is intrinsically cyclical. So the notion of beginning doesn't mean the same thing when time is a circle, as opposed to when time is a line. When mm -hmm. Time is a line. Like our, our modern mindset has a, has a linear sensibility of time. We're, we're on a timeline, like a number line in, in, in an elementary school. And by hypothesis, there's some point zero on that timeline before which we have hmm, what happened before. So in our, you know, in, a, in a kind of a Neil deGrasse Tyson story, there's there mm -hmm. was the Big Bang. That was at T zero, T equals zero, Big Bang. And then we have like, what happened before T equals zero? Uh, interesting question. But we're, we're now on that timeline and we're now at T, whatever number we're at measured by the way in discrete metric units right? so that's a a modern mindset has our modern mindset has a linear conception of time other mindsets have a circular conception of time intuitively like free it's it's axiomatic it's an unconscious axiom it's just an assumption if you don't think about it if you don't spend the time to think about it you're like you, you might get confused because you're if you have two people who are talking about time and one's coming with a circular mindset, the other one's coming with a linear mindset, they think they're talking about the same thing, but they're actually talking about things that have very different consequences. Right. So mindset literally sits above, meaning the kind of mindset that you sit in obviously significantly constrains and conditions the way you might imagine changing or modifying or even what even fit to purpose might even be in the context of an institution. Mm -hmm. But it's much more vague because it's the thing you're using to perceive. And much of the content of the mindset is axiomatic. It's it's preconceived. It's it's just the water. It's just something that is mm -hmm. what you're using to conceive, not the, not something that you conceive itself. Right. Uh, so that's the third layer. Right. So we have the degree to which a given institutional structure happens to be fit to purpose in the context that it's in. We have the degree to which an institutional structure is alive. But we also have the degree to which a mindset, which is a different kind of thing, is itself um, fit to purpose or responsive to the environment that we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so you can see, by the way, for those who are irritated by how vague and, and uh, mm -hmm. difficult to pin down the answer, my answer to the first question was, so now you can understand why I have such a hard time answering it, because we're, we're operating at levels, not just even abstract, but in some sense beyond abstraction itself. Mm. You know, it's it's interesting you say that because, you know, I asked the question of are 
into uh, about our institutions right but it's perhaps annoying but also helpful that you would then go well okay you, you're talking about institutions jack but but actually you know there that is a layer but but that that isn't something which not only can a one single institution ex- not exist alone but that must exist in sort of a, a frame of mind and a way we as a culture think i wonder if if you yourself do you think that again maybe you can't change any one of these by themselves but do you think that you you would want us to change our mindset like like that sort of that that higher level like the way we conceptualize things and and what things might we want to change at that highest level if we if we want to go there <laughs> Well, let's unpack that question. Um, one um, challenge with that question is by what basis might one right. go about even answering that question? You know, what, what, a, a typical answer would be, well, what mindset is determining that we should change our mindset? Uh-huh. So this really is a, a deep paradoxical self-referentiality. And by the way, we can, we can explore if you'd like. We could pause it. We could pause it that... Um, you know, humans, homo sapiens are an evolved creature that had a way of being in the world that is, let's say, physical, basic biological evolution, which is more fundamental <clears throat> than our cognitive mental functions and our cultural functions. And so one could argue from that basis that um, our mindset is secondary to our fitness in the biological sense. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, that underlying basis simply assumes a whole variety of propositions about the nature of reality, that reality is a certain way, um, which other mindsets don't share. Uh, So one thing I could propose is that um, something like practice, meaning actually doing things in the world, is it'll play out. Here's, Here's what I mean. Let's say that you're you imagine, let's just use a simple example. Let's say that I imagine that this coffee cup is real and here. Yeah. Um, and I reach out and I try to grab it and my hand goes right through it. Well, I've, I've learned in some very particular, very, how do I say, uh, uh, concrete and um, simple, like rapid, rapid feedback mm. that my conception, my mindset in this case, was in error in some fashion. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it does appear that death is a thing. Right? It does appear that we die. Um, it's not clear exactly what that means or how it plays out, but it does appear. I think many people would agree that death is a thing and that one might measure that one, at least one significant element of consequences of choices is are you living or dying? Mm-hmm. Uh, it does appear that meaning is a thing and those are not the same. And mm-hmm. one significant element of the context consequences of your choices is is are they meaningful or are you living a meaningful life right and that's an interesting distinction um well, i've made the distinction between like are you surviving versus are you living and uh, to say living is that you're simultaneously surviving and that survival ha- is laden with meaningfulness um mm-hmm. sorry that's a very abstruse but it's something like at least we should be aware of the fact that the the answer to the question of how do we deal with the problem of mindset is itself a very fraught question yeah yeah, yeah. And intrinsically unclear. Um, now, you have to nod away, which is you asked, would I, would I want us to change our mindset? Mm-hmm. Um, I can't actually answer that. Uh, I don't have a sort of a preference in, in, in that mm-hmm. sense. What I would say is something like, to the degree to which we would like to live meaningful lives, then it may very well be that we need to change our mindset. Mm -hmm. To the degree to which we want to continue to survive as a species, I would propose it is quite likely that we will need to change our mindset. So this is more of a a diagnosis and something like a prognosis and a prescription. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's not kind of, it's not mine to sort of make the proposition to, to say I want this to yeah, happen yeah, for yeah. other people in the world that's a, that's up to people to, to make a choice mm-hmm. well, that that that's uh that's actually it. that's a satisfactory answer because from there like i would i'm interested so i've been recently reading uh sort of i, I you know i mean i'm interested in economics but only recently have i been looking at like 
anthropological economics. So how how have sort of societies previously lived? So looking at people like Polanyi and and uh, and David Graeber and, and Marcel Mauss. So I think some of the issues they think about is that or that we kind of think that capitalism is a bit is inevitable, or even if it's not, like where do we go from the system that we we have at the moment? And and the reason why that links to to perhaps mindset that we've been talking about is that I feel like what a lot of them want to sort of posit these anthropologists is that actually we had lots of diversity of ways of living if you look in humanity. So there isn't that much of an inevitability. So I'm just wondering if you have anything anything to say on that note. You know, the degree to which it do you to which things are inevitable versus not inevitable, and that like like on the meta level that can we change it to to what degree do we have agency in that sense it's a hard question i mean it really is actually a fundamentally very difficult question i'm not sure there's any way to ultimately know mm-hmm. at least not on like a way that's logically provable mm-hmm. um, my my basic sense of it for example is that a, a radical um relativism is not true uh, the 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 nature is chaotic or that um, there's an arbitrariness to it. My my basic sense is that there's something like an orderliness. That order ordering the orderliness or um, an objectivity to reality is primitive. That, that there is something about that that is a ground, mm-hmm. uh, and that therefore we we can at, at the, the very least endeavor to identify what that is, and we can have some confidence that. Or conviction that that ground has a solidity to it upon which we can make we can actually make our choices right. um so just to jump in there it's, we, we, yeah. you're kind of it's not like there might be diversity of say economic systems or ways people have lived but it's not like arbitrary it's not you, can, you can't just live any way you want is that that does yeah, that make sense exactly. yeah. mm-hmm. right, so that's the first that's the first piece and then the second piece then is um hmm, let me see this right At any given moment in time, any given particular context, the the, the set of, of valid possible choices are actually relatively narrow. Mm-hmm. So um, while it is the case, we'll actually use it quite concrete, while it is the case that uh, particular kinds of indigenous lifestyle were absolutely real and quite adaptive for long periods of time, I'm, I'm, I'm saying quite, let's just go all the way back to like, before the Upper Paleolithic, or 70, 100,000 years ago, Homo sapiens was thriving um, in a variety of different niches. And there's economic systems, among other things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they were functional. However, um, we can't simply sort of cut and paste, copy paste mm-hmm. those economic systems and attempt to operate them right now in this world um, because they're not functional in this world. So the, the actual set of choices that we have mm-hmm. now are quite constrained by real constraints that are mm-hmm. objective um, and in many ways is quite simplified. Right? So the, the point would be something like, yes, we are not locked into a uh, very, very narrow. There's, there's it probable, I can't say by the way for sure, but it's probable mm-hmm. that we have some degrees of freedom of how we'd like to, of, of what particular system choices we'd like to design. Um, and I, I say it actually more, we may make it more, um, a stronger argument or a stronger statement. We happen to live in a moment right now, which has an unusually high degree of liminality. Uh, and the metaphor I've used in the past for this one is this, like if you imagine a ball, like a heavy metal ball, and there's a, a ball shaped groove on a, like a marble table mm-hmm. and the ball in that groove, um, it's going to go down that groove, right? If you want to move it out of that groove, you have to put a tremendous amount of energy, right? Mm-hmm. This is a great metaphor for something like, let's say capitalism writ 1880, right? So capitalism in 1880, that that ball is heavy, that groove is deep. We're not going to be moving it a lot. You can kind of play a little bit here and there, but it's got a directionality to it and it's got a, 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 a certain locked in, certainly locked mm-hmm. in. But, the, but then imagine that, that as time passes, the groove gets shallower and shallower mm. until, say, by hypothesis, there is no groove at all. So the ball right. is now sitting on a hard steel surface, just to make the metaphor real nice. Mm. Point, the directionality of the ball actually becomes quite 
mm -hmm. uh, unpredictable. Tiny, tiny deviations in the in the surface and the directionality. Even a small, small, small gust of wind might move the ball. Right. So different contexts have different degrees of uh, coercion or different degrees of inertia. Um, and we're in a context right now where things are quite up. Um, things that have been impossible or very difficult to change for mm -hmm. hundreds of years or even millennia or even many millennia, like say money, um, now may in fact have become, have been rendered much more fluid mm. and may act more, more changeable. And that's, I think that's very important for people to have as part of their, their framework. Mm -hmm. Timing matters. Context matters, right? What could not have been done in, say, 1970, maybe can be done now. And right. what could not be done in 1000 AD may actually be necessary, maybe unavoidable now. Right? So let's keep that in mind. And um, another metaphor that I've often used, uh, I think I took it from Manuel de Landa, has to do with something like temperature and, and viscosity. So just like ice. Mm -hmm. When the temperature is below a certain level, water is ice, and ice is solid. Ice it doesn't fluidly move around. Mm -hmm. But once the water crosses that threshold to a certain level, it turns into water. And water has very different characteristics, right? It's fluid. Mm -hmm. You can pour it into a vessel and it takes the shape of the vessel. And by the way, turn it up a little bit more and it becomes a uh, vapor, right? It becomes mm -hmm. steam. It has different characteristics. And so the point is something like um, what's the temperature? If the temperature is going up, things that had hitherto been solid mm -hmm. so long, you simply have assumed that they are by nature only solid. Mm -hmm. They may melt. And when they melt, their their characteristics change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very interesting. And this might I kind of want to go into the then the specifics of some of the things in our world today. And it in that in that, you know, you talk about our what then is our environment today? What what are we working with with? What things might we have assumed to have been static that were not? So I kind of want to ask about blockchain and, and NFTs because I've recently been writing an essay on the the interesting fact that say like the creation of Bitcoin we start consciously like trying to think about and creating money and not that we necessarily didn't do that in our human past but at least in our current sort of past couple hundred years it's like a, for me an interesting thing that we started doing that so I'm wondering like does this machinery do these toolkits to what 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 do they do they change? And is it right to say, think of like Bitcoin versus versus blockchain in general? Is it right to think of them as sort of same to what degree does it do? Does, it, does, it, does, any, does any individual thing take precedence? Or... Well, that that is a, I think it's a very interesting question. I've thought about it quite a bit. Um, let's see. All right. So given what I said earlier, this notion of um, temperature and flexibility or fluidity and solidity, there's a, a a metaphor of like depth of depth or depth in the stack. Right? So the deeper something is in this in this frame, the more invariant it is under more conditions. Mm -hmm. So by hypothesis, something which is actually eternal and unchanging would be the deepest possible point in the stack. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really useful. By the way, if things are eternal or un, and unchanging, you can build on those. So if you can find those, use them. Um, and, and as you go up in the stack, you have things that are are less eternal and unchanging. They, they are finite and they change, but they may be highly, highly, highly conserved over large contexts. Okay. So one of the things to think about as kind of like a rule of thumb is as the context you're in is highly liminal, it's, it's highly uh, uncertain or substantial amount of change. The temperature is high. Um, go deep in the stack, find things that are very, very, very solid so that you can have confidence as you're building with them. Okay. Mm -hmm. The reason why I'm saying that is that to answer your question around Bitcoin and blockchain requires that you actually go rather deep in the stack. And I'm going to take you on that mm -hmm. journey. And uh, I'm just warning you, right? This is right. actually extremely deep. This is not trivial. And most of the time, most of the people who have been thinking about these sorts of problems have not gone anywhere near deep enough. Mm -hmm. Um oftentimes trivial, oftentimes frankly, they're thinking about it at a very trivial level, like, mm -hmm. okay, Bitcoin digital gold fair enough right it's not a it's not a brutal way of thinking about things there's actually not a bad map in between the two it allows you to move forward from kind of the satoshi white paper into buying buying something with you know buying mm -hmm. pizza but that's not going to take you far enough um all right 
So let's see. First order, I agree with you that something occurred with the emergence of Bitcoin in terms of something like mindset around the nature of money. Mm. The prior Bitcoin money was for almost everybody, and this includes, by the way, central bankers, received as something that was woven, was natural. It was invariant. Humans didn't really spend a lot of time designing money. Mm. We didn't create money. We just sort of used the money we had right? with these weird kind of like swept behind the underneath the rug. Well, we moved from gold back money to fiat money. Yeah, but that was kind of like, let's ignore that. Let's just not, mm. we live in fiat money now. This is how it works, that kind of a thing. Mm. Uh, don't touch that button. Um, but now we're way, way past touching that button, right? Now, an entire generation of which you are a member has a completely naive, and I don't mean this as a negative thing, like a completely basic assumption that money design is something you can do. In fact, something you do, do people just design money um, and design many different kinds of money. We can tweak parameters. We can actually get a sense of what the parameters are and play with different variabilities. Okay, so that's that's a huge shift. That, that shift is by the way, catastrophic. I don't know if you're uh, if somebody who happens to be living in like you know, a boomer, boomer, boomers living in central bank land. I got bad news for you. That game is straight up over, right? A consciousness of money is a thing that we actually design uh, is now, it's, we're across the Rubicon on that. That's happening. And so a world where monetary systems are supposedly carved into stone is antiquity. That's not the world we live in anymore. Um, that doesn't mean that central banks don't have power and that says states can't use the legacy power that they have to force people to adopt the designs that they want to design. But now it's very clearly a conscious constraint, not a, oh, of course you just use the money you have. Okay, so that's that. So let's now take it, let's go a few levels down. Um, oof, let's see. Should I go all the way to the bottom? Yeah, let's yeah. try this for a little this is going to be very abstract again, yeah. but we have to do. This is, um, I had two conversations with a gentleman named Matthew Pierkowski. He's the one who I think has said this, let's say the most effectively. It's not easy. It's not particularly clear, but we're in early stages. So mm -hmm. we need to make, make allowances for the fact that it's difficult to articulate things that we're just beginning to figure out for ourselves. Mm -hmm. But here's the, the frame that we, we talked about. There's certain kinds of, of phenomena in reality. And one example would be the mitochondrion. Do you know what that is? Like in biology? Yeah, yeah. Uh, another example would be a water wheel, okay? And let's use the mitochondrion as an example. So historically, as we're sort of moving into the mitochondrion, what we're dealing with is the notion of cellularity, the notion of a cell. Mm -hmm which doesn't exist. Right? We have chemist chemistry happening. Periodically, we have things like little uh, bubbles of, of uh, interiority that form and then go away. We have RNA and, and, and DNA playing with each other, looking at replication and how to conserve information. Mm. Uh, but there's, a, there's this, this thing, cellularity, which for the moment, I'm actually going to call it a scene. And mm. maybe that would be idea, but we'll just use it for the moment. There's a cellularity scene. Uh, of which there's many different problems that need to be solved. But a very, very specific problem that needs to be solved, which is very basic, is energy is needed to drive all the different processes inside, oh, in chemistry, in general. Mm -hmm. And there is a, a need for an energy gradient to cr create the transformations that are underlying all these different elements of cells. So to form a... Uh, a boundary, there's an energy gradient that's needed to form that boundary and different energy gradients in the ambient environment that we can't really count on and rely on are um, producing this these things, which is giving the, the environment the ability to sort of notice that cell walls are really called interiors are forming, mm -hmm. but they're very uh, epis, they're very stochastic, they're random. Replication, like yeah, protein synthesis and things like that. Uh, not protein synthesis, but DNA and RNA replication also requires energy, but again, non-reliable. Mm. So there's like an opportunity there. If something can figure out how to create a reliable energy gradient, then that something will create a change in the state of possibility in this chemistry landscape. And that's the mitochondrion. Right? The mm. mitochondrion solved the problem of how to convert 
um, you know, ambient energy, in this case, chemical energy, into a very reliable, very consistent, by the way, in this case, highly uh, fungible unit, ATP. Mm-hmm. So you can take sugar energy that happens to be in the environment, of a variety of different forms, by the way, and ultimately metabolize it into ATP. And ATP now can very easily be used by a wide variety of metabolic processes. Many, many, many metabolic processes can use ATP, and that provides the energy gradient that they need to do their thing. And mm-hmm. So once, once the mitochondrion is kind of what to say perfected or, or solidified, that changes the, game, the state of play completely mm-hmm. in this world of chemistry. And it really forms the, what do you call it, a binding closure or a kind of a binding point between chemistry land and cell land. Right? So you really do a regime where you're st- mostly living in, in the, according to the rules of chemistry, to a whole new domain where you're living by the rules of what is going to become cell. Right, right. right and right. energy is very fundamental. I mean, think about things that are low in the stack. Energy is very low in the stack. Uh, maybe not as low as you can go, but close, right? Maybe layer two or layer three. Um, and so anything, any domain, any uh, new, uh, say, niche or space of possibility is likely going to have a question around energy. So let's just move to the notion of water wheel, um, just to quickly kind of try to same logic to describe it. So in a water wheel, we have, a again, a basic problem. I have a reservoir of energy, in this case, flowing water, which is gravity and the propensity of water to, to, to flow. Um, it has viscosity, it has density, things like that, mm. which is hard to use on its own. That is, it's, a, it's a potential, right? so it's a reservoir of potential, but um, converting it into, into, into useful energy naturally is very difficult. Mm. The water wheel is like the, the mitochondria. The water wheel converts the randomness and the variability um, and the particularity of the flow of water into a consistent, um, fungible, therefore highly useful form of energy, which we can now convert into a wide variety of different uses. You can use a water wheel to power a potter's wheel. You can use a water wheel to, to mill flour. You can use a water wheel uh, to um, mill create, through a transformation you turn it into linear as opposed to rotational energy and mill wood. And mm-hmm. so the water wheel is, is like mitochondria in the sense that it converts a regime of energy from a highly potential, but very difficult to make useful. It creates a very specific binding closure between that regime and a new regime, which now has a lot of different kinds of functional uses. In a second. Hey, Vanessa. Vanessa. Do you mind pushing that close to the Um. All right, so now we're finally ready to talk about Bitcoin and blockchain. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh shoot, not quite. I have to talk about the blockchain side of this. Okay. So in the metaphor that we're using, the hypothesis is that Bitcoin is like the mitochondrion. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like a, uh, a transformer that fundamentally converts energy into a very specific kind of useful, in this case, information. And that's that, by the way, breaks open a whole big can of worms. But for the moment, let's just stick with it converts energy from one form into another form. And that other form is highly fungible and highly useful. The other form, as it turns out, happens to be a, uh, a global consensus that solves the Byzantine general's problem, but mm-hmm. just to that for the moment. That is highly conserved. You know, mitochondria don't change. You got mitochondria in all kinds of cells. Like every cell has mitochondria mm-hmm. across all kinds of life, animal life. Um, same mitochondria, right? Different cells, same mitochondria. One solution, one problem, very fundamental problem, therefore a foundation. Like it's a foundational technology. Mm-hmm. On top of that foundational technology, however, there's actually a need and an opportunity for a different morphology. And these are all the different variations on metabolism and things that sit on top of metabolism that can happen in cell space. So some cells become cardiac cells, some cells become neurons, right? Different kinds of cells that are all exploring different niches in cell space. They're all sitting on top of the possibility of doing cell at all as a consequence of mitochondria. But mitochondria is not the end of the story. It's the beginning of a new story. 
And in this new story, we actually need a different morphology, which are things that explore the space that's opened up by mitochondrion and where a new possibility emerges, they coalesce around that and form uh, a proper solution. Right? So it's a different, um, a neuron is a different kind of cell and has a very different set of characteristics, and requirements and potentialities than say, for example, a bone cell or a skin cell or, or an autoimmune cell. And think about the difference in cellularity. Okay, uh, <laughs> Bitcoin is mitochondria, blockchain is cell or stem cell, like these different kinds of cells. And what I mean is that the Bitcoin is a particular kind of solution to a very specific problem mm. that is foundational and forms a foundation upon which a whole new regime opens up and things can happen. Mm. But the exploration of that space of possibility now requires a different set of approaches. And these different set of approaches are more ephemeral, meaning... Um, they, they will they will have a much higher likelihood of failure because mm. they're exploring the space, looking for something that may actually require a lot of complicatedness. Like it took a long time to go from basic, a cell that had some degree of sensitivity to its exterior environment <clears throat> to like atoms, right? There's a lot of, a lot of distance. Mm -hmm. And so evolutionary trajectory of, of exploring, let's say blockchain space to find things that are actually rather significant and durable and useful right. and by many of which actually only work in combination with each other mm -hmm. is a whole journey right and so it requires uh, a higher degree of of ability to explore to mutate right. um a degree of experimentation both in terms of of the the way it moves out into the environment but also the um fluidity with which it considers different possible approaches and so these are both part, right? Bitcoin and blockchain are, are two fundamental parts. Now the fundamental parts of a basic thing that seems to recur in history, in long history. And Bitcoin represents one part of it. And this other thing, which for the moment we'll just call blockchain or mm. crypto, broadly speaking, everyone would call it. Um, it. It represents another part and they're both critical, right? They're both necessary parts. So that's the... That's the the journey. Did that any of yeah, that yeah, land? Yeah. That, that that that's a it's an interesting formulation, and it you know it's it's helpful in contextualizing some things I've heard you say about how say with blockchain the fact that it's a really powerful not just like even just technology but it like it's just a undergirding almost energy potential right a platform around right. which things can happen a possibility space but it's therefore hard to actually imagine the specific instantiations of of what it's going to do right like how when you have mitochondria you can't necessarily say what exactly is going to be created right, right. but it doesn't mean that but but you know but you have to then appreciate the fact that 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 underlying is <laughs> mitochondria is just so useful you know but then i guess i wanted to a couple of things i wanted to say but one is like sometimes i and i know it's it's early days in it but sometimes i'm like to what degree has blockchain or, or bitcoin fulfilled its potential and 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 are we are we sh and maybe maybe i want to dig a bit deeper into precisely like why you think like specifically you say bitcoin why 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 do you think it would be so fundamental in terms of being something uh, like mitochondria oh so I, I was actually thought we were going one way we're going another way so let me read the sorry you can, you can go no, that no, way okay. if you want. the 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 second way is is more it's harder, but of course it's, it's more important. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get to the other part. Like, okay, so why are, to what degree are we on the right track or to what degree are we uh, sort of elegantly exploring this new space and to what degree are we getting in our own way? So that's, mm -hmm. that's one question. The second question is something like, um, why would I imagine this is important at all? Mm -hmm. Let me take it out of Bitcoin for the moment and let's put it in a different, a different part of the story called NFTs because I think this actually highlights the point mm -hmm. quite profoundly. Uh, because the instantiation, the instantiation of Bitcoin as such so far does at least partake in the notion of money. And you can make an argument of, well, mm. Bitcoin is sort of a, a newer and maybe even a more fundamental form of money. And that's a big deal. And I was like, yep, big deal. You may ar argue with the, you may disagree with the argument, but you can't disagree with the premise. If Bitcoin represents a more fundamental form of money, then that's a big deal. Yep, that's true. I may not agree agree that it does but if it does then then the conclusion follows okay hmm. i'm gonna use nfts right because so far at least 
NFTs represent something which is somewhere between trivial and laughable. My argument is they are in fact very profound, not even a little bit profound, but very profound. Um, I may not be able to convince you, but at least let me kind of use the argument to illustrate the point. Sure. Uh, and the key actually comes, I'll do it this way. It works for me. It doesn't work for everybody. I'll use the the, the name, you know, NFT, non-fungible token. And the first thing I point out is the conceptual relationship, which requires us to put the prefix non in front of the word fungible. What that implies is that we have an assumption that the base case is fungible, that the fungible is the standard, and that on occasion we can do something that produces an, a different kind of thing that is non-fungible, okay? Mm -hmm. And the point I would make is that this is actually a very deep mindset using some of our earlier language. This is a deep, um, how would you say, what's the word? Well, ultimately it's an unconscious assumption. It's a very old one that if you look at nature, if you look at reality, Reality is actually most fundamentally made up of things that we would consider to be non-fungible. Uh, fungibility is actually a consequence of humanity at the end right. of the day, right? or at least at the con a consequence of some kind of process. And there's a process. That process takes the uniqueness, the complexity, the richness of some phenomenon, and it only selects for some small subset of that. And so... Um, you know, I have, I have a, a tree and I am only worried about the degree to which that tree can afford the production of two by fours, right? So I take away all of the other aspects of the tree of which there are many, many, many. There's its fixation of the uh, soil. There's the way that it forms a habitat for fungi. There's obviously the way it forms a habitat for insects and birds. There's the metabolism of, of carbon. There's the shade creating shade and temperature differentials like there's whatever, quadrillion distinct things that is that are happening in the context of the uniqueness of the tree, the complexity of the tree. Mm -hmm. And I'm selecting out whatever, 99.99999% of that for a tiny, tiny subset of that that I'm going to consider to be the characteristic. And what I'm doing is I'm rendering the tree fungible. And I, I actually have to go through a process. I kill it, I cut it down, I mill it. And at the end of that process, I now have a fungible object of two by four, right. which is very useful in the sense of I can now plug it into processes that require two by fours as the input and I can run it right without any friction. Mm -hmm. It's a human thing, right? That's a, a very human, the, the notion of fungibility as being a primary characteristic of reality. Um, we make it that way. Right? We, we do that. Um, at a natural level, yes, there are processes, countless processes that only take a subset of the complexity of the environment they're operating in. Uh, but the dominant aspect of nature is its non-fungibility. Let's just for the moment say it's singularity, it's particularity. Mm -hmm. uh, and just to kind of hammer that home, the, this is not an unknown mindset. Like even in humans, there's a, a story that I've been told, which I believe, that if you take an image, like a photograph of a person walking through the forest. And you show that to a person who is weird, Western, you know, Western minds. They'll say, that's a picture of a human walking through a forest. Mm. If you show it to somebody who has an indigenous mindset, they'll say, oh, that's a picture of a forest. And, oh, and there's a human in it. Right? Uh -huh. See the foreground, background, like what is, mm. what is, what's, what's, what's the assumption and what's the, the context or what's the thing that you're salient in context mm. is a flip. In the indigenous sense, the non-fungibility is primary and fungibility is secondary. In a modern mindset, fungibility is primary and therefore we have to use the word non to describe things that are non-fungible. Okay. In the context of what's happening in, in crypto, in blockchain space, whatever we want to call that, um, we're rediscovering the characteristic of the non-fungible. And we're exploring that and, and naively exploring because we're, we're a lot of moderns are far away from an indigenous mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, even, even like a, a medieval mindset had a primacy on what we would call the non-fungible, like the theological, the notion of beings that are real and invariant and everything else is a derivative of those beings. Right? The thing that is most real is that which is singular, not that which is fungible. Mm -hmm. So we would 
singularities or beings um, of which God would be the being of beings, right? The, the, the top of that stack mm -hmm. and everything else is the great chain of being right? derivative down. And the fungible stuff would be like the very bottom, like the less, least relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, so medieval mindset, indigenous mindset, medieval mindset, modern mindset. So what I would propose is that part of what's happening in NFT space is a highly unconscious, in many cases, artistic or intuitive discovery or rediscovery of the entire domain of the non-fungible. And, and because that actually is, it really is more fundamental, mm. uh, a search almost by you know eyes closed and with hands a search of this space deeply aphasic we've forgotten so much about reality we're trying to relearn reality and we're searching the space and rediscovering mm -hmm. um, and our mode of searching in this in, in our environment happens to be driven by largely by um salience salience landscape mm -hmm. and living in the end stages of capitalism, much of our salience landscaping has been captured by money. And so if you understand those steps, it's not surprising that the search of some new landscape, be it AI or cinema, I want to go back a few generations, mm -hmm. or NFTs, is dominated, in fact, by money initially, because we we're reverse engineering, we're, we're, we're backing out of a uh -huh. world where uh -huh. money capture our salience landscaping, which captured our attention, which we've been using money to figure out what's important and what's meaningful and how to find, you know, how to orient our attention and our energy. And um, so the fact that NFT space was sort of initially dominated by an explosion of how do we use it to make money isn't surprising. Right. But that's not the meaning of it, right? That's not the essence of it. The essence transcends that entire category. Um, in fact, perhaps categorically, it may in fact be as transcendent as the notion of transcendence itself. That's a weird set of frame, words, but if you parse that, right, right. it's a meaningful sentence. Uh, you know, go on. Yeah, let me just, just do the last piece. So the, yeah, last piece is, sure. the last piece is a little bit funny, but I, I still want to play with it, which is this word, token. And the argument that I want to make is something like this, an upside downness or an inversion. Just like fungible and non-fungible have this inversion. Mm. And the argument is that we're operating in a fundamental shift, a move from a regime dominated by the logic of the quantitative, which is fungibility, to a regime dominated, a restoration of the reality that is governed by the qualitative, which is non-fungible. Mm. So the idea that we have been living now for a long time, 500 years at least, maybe much longer, in a world that is dominated by the logic of the quantitative, we are restoring a regime that is governed by the reality of the qualitative. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the big thematic. And let's just play with the word token. Um, Cause I was, I was curious about that word. Um, it's a little bit like icon in the, in the computer sense. Right? We have these words that have a history to them and they mean things in their history. And we've extracted them into our modern environment. Sort of like to shoot. Okay. We can use that word. Let's call it a yeah. token. In our, in our modern vernacular, the word token represents like um, even some sort of superficiality. Right, this right. Token X, or I'll, I'll, do a, I'll do a token job. Uh, but if you look at the etymology, the etymology goes all the way down to the notion of the token. Right? It's actually a uh, very potent, it's one of the most potent terms. It, it represents the assigning of a name. You know, think about it from like the, from like the you know, Jewish... Adam, right? the assigning of a name to a being. Now, this is a connection between ontology, the nature of reality, things that are in their internal essence, mm -hmm. indigenous and medieval mindset, to a word that can be expressed by humans and shared with each other in communication. And the, the unique betokening mm -hmm. of reality, which is a very big deal. Right? It's a very, right. very powerful idea. So in this inversion, it's funny that we, and I, I think this is not at all um, random, that we have found ourselves using terms like non-fungible token in the most trivial and in some sense, most superficial way possible. But they point, if you, if yeah, you, look through, yeah. if you use them as symbols, you look through them, they point actually to a restoration of the most meaningful. 
Mm. The, you know, yeah, the, well, this all, um, and I've, I've looked, heard these and read about these ideas of yours also before. So, but it, in the shift you're pointing to through NFTs and blockchain, it makes me think a lot of Ian McGilchrist's sort of left hemisphere to right hemisphere, right? Like, uh, you know, even so, so the left hemisphere for, for people listening sort of aspectualizes and sees parts rather than holes. And that is kind of like a fu- making fungible of something sort of inherently non-fungible. And it's, it's interesting because like there's a book, The Mystery of Capital, which talks about the fact that capital and property rights, it makes, it makes things fungible and it just takes one aspect of things. And in a way you kind of need to do that. It's, you could say in a way it's a good thing, or it's at least an interesting thing to say, you look at a tree and be like, well, that's something we can just use to get a word, right? If it, if you didn't like language, if you don't aspectualize, you don't use it to, to pass the world so that you can see similarities and, and, and check that with others. It's a, it's a tool, but it makes me think that again, to maybe link it back to the mindset and some of the things we talked about at the start that like, it's uh, in some ways, again, I don't want to like overhype something, but some ways I be, I think about NFTs and blockchain is like a, a like Hamburg Gilchrist says that some parts of language are more left hemispheric and they actually come from a more musical, more a proto language that sees the fullness of things in a way it's like a evolution of language itself, right? The way in mm-hmm. which we kind of speak about the world, because yeah, it's very interesting. That last point you made um, that it's a, a pointer to try and help us see the fullness in things. It's it's a very interesting conceptual idea for me. And I've been trying to think a lot about what would it mean, you know, to what would it mean to actually be able for us to, you could say, literally see the moreness of a good, like rather than like, like the oh. economic goods around us. I mean, what would it actually mean to be able to, to still have the usefulness of mm-hmm. the abstractions we've created. I'm not, you know, I'm not like trying to pose this as a question. These are difficult issues, but you know, it's it's something I've thought a lot about. Um, given the the overall potential, what what would it mean to to, to actually implement that? Um that's anyway, that's that's an idea. Um I uh, no, no, you have to the answer by the way would be the word sacred. The word sacred is, I think, the best response to that. Mm-hmm. It would be restoration of a sacred relationship to reality and we had the feeling that feeling of sacredness a feeling that um reality is intrinsically meaningful that your choices are intrinsically significant um and that great care can and should be taken in in relationship to the choices that you make um which in some sense may be perceived as being trivial I would propose that the world we live in has been so thoroughly drained of meaningfulness and significance and care that it is the opposite of trivial. It is incredibly Mm. profound. Um, And therefore would change the nature of the world that you live in. So you'd have a relationship with choices and with the world and with yourself, by the way, Mm. that words like sacred and care and meaningful and significant would be primary. And therefore the choices you make would be different. And therefore the world that we live in would also be different. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's you know um i have other topics but that it's it seems like a, a fine place to close especially because it's, it's it's been about an hour um yeah but one yeah but but one thing i yeah one finally i wanted to ask was just for people like trying to grapple with these same ideas or i talked about off there i think you know to have the sort of goal you could say to try and want to grapple with how how can one like think about these bigger issues and try and help improve civilizations you know you you came at it from a complexity and complex systems background you know how how, how do you think one should try and grapple with these these questions like i mean in a practical level like how how, how does one try and uh-huh. do that well here's, here's here's what i would say is first um and, and it's actually one of the essays the earliest essays i wrote on this was um uh, thinking and simulated thinking and many people, well, I don't know, some people, I don't know many, some people took this as simply saying the thinking fast and thinking slow in a different way, but it's not. It's actually very much not that. Um, the point is that humans ambiently have a basic capacity for thinking. Um, and 
what you're asking is ultimately restore the, the response, the basic response is restore your basic capacity for thinking at all. And that's a dispositional as well as a uh, kind of a technical capacity. The trap that we found ourselves in as a consequence of the instead of landscapes um, and the um, kind of the formal teachings of the institutions that we've created and we immersed ourselves in is that we're not just prioritizing thinking fast over thinking slow, but mm -hmm. rather we're actually using a completely different modality that I call simulated thinking that is effectively algorithmic. Uh, now that we have chat GPT, it's very nice. Chat GPT is simulated thinking. Mm -hmm. And we've taken humans engaging in simulated thinking which basically by the way is a sort of sort of linguistic lookup table mm -hmm. an input comes you look in a lookup table for the appropriate sem semantic output and you produce that semantic output this is what school teaches you how to do mm -hmm. unfortunately that's not thinking that's simulated thinking and right? that's an algorithmic mind you've converted your mind from a thinking thing into a artificial you converted a natural intelligence into a very poor artificial intelligence right um, and I would argue, by the way, simply enough, now that we have real artificial intelligence, which is quite good at being artificial intelligence, everybody who's operating as a poor artificial intelligence is going to find themselves outcompeted in that landscape. Mm -hmm. But artificial intelligence isn't natural intelligence. So the, the basic first step is to go through the process of restoring your natural intelligence. And this has things like becoming more embodied, bringing your mind left and right in, back into wholeness learning what relationality looks like, kind of turns into dialogue with other humans, right? Natural human intelligence is actually group. It's not individual. Mm -hmm. um, we're only properly thinking, we're thinking groups. Mm -hmm. And so learning how to do that as well. Right? So physical dispositions, cognitive, neurocognitive dispositions, building them as habits, making them sort of a basic ha habit or character, learning how to do that with more people, noticing when in, in groups are we entering into dialogos or are we entering into debate or are we simply mm -hmm. passing tokens back and forth tokens in the weak sense mm -hmm. back and forth to each other um are we engaging in collective simulated thinking that kind of stuff right like reading those basic skills it's a skills thing once you've gotten decent you've got good habits and you've got decent capacity in those basic skills now you are prepared to engage in the bigger story more meaningfully Right. And in that case, join the conversation or join the hyper conversation is the proper term, mm. which are, right, we're doing this right now. You are, we're, we're participating in the hyper conversation here. And then that's a whole other question, right? So maybe we can have that other question separately, but the whole other right. question is how do we participate in the hyper conversation is like, it's its own thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. Any last words that you want to say or where people can find that you? Felt like a very good, that felt like a very good coda. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you.